Welcome to Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. While I have your attention, I'd like to ask that if you like what I'm doing, please like this video, subscribe to my channel, hit the notification bell, share me on social media, and tell all of your friends, family, neighbors, pets, and livestock to do the same. Following me on social media is really important and sharing my videos is really important because I'm a one-man shop with absolutely no money for advertising, so the only way that I can grow is through social media. So please follow me on Twitter at SYLTales and frankly on any other social media known to man. I would appreciate your support via my PayPal tip jar, my subscribe star, my merch store on Teespring, or a place on my website where you can support me further. And there are links to all of these in my description box. Well, I was, you know, really disappointed with this episode. After finally having gotten some character development for the Doctor after a year and a half, I thought we'd go into investigating this arc with the Doctor, the Master, the earlier Doctor, and the Time Lords, and I hope maybe we'd even see more of some Captain Jack back soon. And then all, all of my hopes were dashed by yet another disconnected, one-and-done SJW cringe fest. I actually damn near fell asleep during this one. Now, maybe it's because I have been a little tired lately, Maybe it was because it was so boring. Maybe it was because it was just another SJW fringe fest. Maybe it was because things were do the companions were doing things that were completely beyond their competency. But mostly, I think it was because after a decent episode that seemed to be setting up some arcs, Chris Chibnall went back and said, nah, screw wib wibbly-wobbly, timey-wimey science fiction. What our viewers really want is to be lectured to in the most preachy, predictable way. So, with that non-spoiler review, um, it's just free to give yourself this one a miss, unless you're hopped up on caffeine or something. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. All hands, prepare for incoming spoilers. So, yes, the remainder of this episode is a spoiler. That is because I am a Fandai master, and that is because the fandom is a strong with me. And that means that nothing is new, nothing is original, and at worst I figure it out about a half an hour too early. This is neither a boast nor a brag. This is sadly where you find yourself after having watched, read, and listened to over a hundred years worth of science fiction. You just can't see the new stuff for the whole century that came before. And it turns out there isn't that much that's new in the world. And it can interfere with your ability to enjoy things. Although this one was interfered with, but not for any of the reasons that it was... Uh, well, sure, there was nothing new about it, but that wasn't why it was spoiled. It, it was horrible. Great moments. I usually try to say something good about an episode right off the bat if I can, if there's something good to say, but unfortunately this time I have nothing to say. There were no great moments. I guess I liked it when it was over. Other than that, no other great moments. Done and done. Cringe moments always come after my great moments. General cringe moments. This was the usual Chris Chibnall crap. There was no character development. It was a preachy story. It was virtue signaling SJW tripe. And companions were doing things that made little sense, nor were they consistent with their technological capabilities. To be specific, right in the first opening monologue, when the doctor's saying things like, Seven billion lives, separate but connected. No, Chibno, you incredible hippie. Those seven billion lives are not connected. This is one of those things that sounds really nice when it comes out of some SJW's mouth, but in fact we are all not connected. Most of us are barely connected even to our loved ones. What I do, however, has absolutely no impact on Chris Chibnall. Clearly, if it did, he wouldn't be writing SJW crap. Nor does Chris Chibnall have any impact on me, aside from giving me something to review every week or for 10 weeks out of a year. This whole stupid concept sounds good on the surface, but breaks down under any level of scrutiny, as does any SJW message. The plastic pollution message. Okay, yes, we know. We know! There are some areas of the ocean where plastic has con congealed into certain spots because of the way that certain, uh, you know, different currents work. 
And it sucks. We all know that. Nobody's saying, hoo let's go put some more plastic out there. But, you know, when you're... You know how... Uh, what a smarter writer, you know, one with a knowledge of Doctor Who lore, as well as an understanding of science fiction, might have done with this same episode? They could have staged a return of the nesting consciousness. You know, those guys that appeared in two of Pertwee's ep episodes, as well as one of Eccleston's. In fact, it was the first episode of the 2005 series. You know, the thing that controlled the plastic. Wouldn't this episode have been a hell of a lot more fun if the Nestine Consciousness were using the, say, the Great Pacific gar Garbage uh, Patch in order to do its thing? That's a real thing, by the way, the Great Pacific gar Garbage Patch. I have a link to it in my description box. What if the Nestine Consciousness were using this giant, all the plastic that's out there, and creating giant plastic monsters that threatened, say, Los Angeles or the west coast of the U.S.? It would have been fun then to see how the Doctor would deal with King Kong-sized level garbage monsters, you know? And you could have still had a story about, you know, with a message about the garbage, but without having to smack us across the head repeatedly with a two-by-four. Unfortunately, that's the only thing Chidnall knows how to do, is smack us across the head with a two-by-four. The guy is arguably more preachy than Gene Roddenberry, and in a far more irritating way. Characters doing technological things, this is another cringe moment, that they shouldn't know how to do. When have we ever seen any of these companions capable of dealing with the advanced technology that they did in this episode? Oh, that's right, never. It stuck out like a massive sore thumb. Another cringe moment, the gay astronaut and his boyfriend. Yes, Chris, we understand. There are gay people. We see them every day in real life, and nobody cares. I'm 55 years old, and nobody that I know cares. If you know somebody who cares, if it's a big deal where you live, then it's your problem. It's the problem with your friends. The rest of the world doesn't have a problem with it. So stop pretending that this is like Saudi Arabia, where they throw gay people off of buildings to their death. In the Western world, aside apparently from your SJW friends who need to hear this message, nobody cares. If you want to have this fixed, talk to your SJW friends who hate gay people. Stop trying to bash us over the head with me the message gay people are people too. We know Chris, everybody knows, and nobody cares. Get your head out of your SJW behind and write something new for a change. The astronaut uh, is uh, b boyfriend is ca being, cap being capable of, of getting from the UK to Hong Kong in the same amount of time that it took for the doctor to drop her team off in the TARDIS. Now, I checked, and a Heathrow, London to Hong Kong flight takes about 12 and a half hours, longer if there are layovers. It takes the TARDIS approximately 10 seconds or less to traverse the same distance. The TARDIS team would have been to Hong Kong and done before the boyfriend even got onto Heathrow for his air flight. Breaking the TARDIS crew team up was a dumb idea. Um, this makes absolutely no sense. As the episode clearly makes clear, the Doctor is only 30 seconds away from each incident, and only the only one that actually mattered very much was at Madagascar. Either let the entire crew spend five minutes on each location and uh, end up in Madagascar, or just don't bother. You wouldn't have had to have Yaz do anything stupid like transmat herself uh, to an unknown location. The doctor could have just as easily reversed the polarity of the neutron flow and figured it out, which she kind of did. You didn't have to have Yaz doing something stupid that could have gotten her killed. This whole story could and should have been tied into the arc that we saw unfolding last week. I had hoped that perhaps Chibnall had learned from prior Doctor Who and figured out that arcs are in fact a good thing and that the show would then begin, begin going on to do the next five whole episodes on this arc. Now I'm reasonably certain that whatever we started talking about in the middle of the season will only come up again in episode 10, possibly episode 9. I'm disappointed, but I shouldn't be surprised. Chibnall has proved himself to be an SJW's SJW. That's all that he knows how to do is write the little hack fraud. 
In short, very damn little of this episode made any sense. It could have been far more interesting very easily. It didn't have to whack you over the head repeatedly with a two by four so that you got the stupid, irrelevant, and often inaccurate SJW message. So, stop with the SJW, Chris. If you don't, both you and Jody Whitaker will be on the dole after this season, and without with you, you may very well take the show's cancellation. I always like to talk about writers when I get into the nitty-gritty, although I'm not getting into as much nitty-gritty on this as I might otherwise. It'll become apparent why in a moment. But I always start with a script, because everything begins and ends with the script. Because without a script, you ain't got nothing to shoot. Anything dramatic in the script, good, bad, or ugly, is ultimately the fault of your writers. And the writers on this were Chris Chibnall and Peter McTighe. Chibnall is a proven hack fraud. McTighe has written one other script, Season 11's episode, Kerblam. Now, that was another preachy episode about the working conditions at Amazon. It was preachy, but probably not as preachy as this episode. Well, so we'll just blame, really, the worst SJW preachiness largely on Chibnall, where it no doubt belongs. In terms of acting, I really have nothing specific to say about any of the actors. They gave fine performances, considering that they were almost some level of SJW exposition. When they weren't just expositing outright like the doctor often did, they were reinforcing with what they had, with what little character development they were giving. It was all just about this message. Garbage, garbage, plastic, garbage, plastic, garbage. Oh, you're destroying the planet. Plastic, garbage. Yes, thanks, Chris. Okay, we got it the first ten times. Stop hitting me, Chris. Stop hitting me over the head with the two before, Chris. Quit. I really have, again, no qualms with their performances. It's just a shame that their talents were being wasted on this SJW virtue signaling. The director was uh, uh, Jamie Stone, and uh, he has done previously some directing on Doctor Who. Did Clara and the TARDIS Minisode and Spyfall, Spyfall Part 1. He's scheduled for Episodes 9 and 10. I have no problem, really, with the direction. It was unremarkable. But then how can you do really amazing direction in the service of massive SJW virtue signaling? It was impossible to be given any moment in which to shine under those circumstances. Similarly, the cinematography by Sam Heason. Um, ditto for him. You know, he did some good work, but it, when you are trapped by this SJW and it's constant hitting you across the head with a two-by-four, there isn't much way around that. You can't find any you know, way to really shine given what you've got. Our direction was by Nick Murray, uh, same as above, um, fine work, in the service of SJW virtue signaling. It was really impossible to be given any moment to shine under those restrictions. Music was credited to Sugun Akinola. However, IMDb largely uh, lists the music publisher and supervisor, uh, mixer, editor, and engineer, which almost certainly means that they're reusing cues written by Sugun Akinola. That's normal. You don't you know, usually score every single episode. You score the ones that you think are going to need the music more, and then you mix them together. Um, it was mixed well, but totally forgettable. Um, it's been all of uh, about four hours since the episode aired, and uh, I don't remember a single note. Visual effects supervisor was Sheila Wickens. Um, the visual effects were fine. There was never a point at which you pointed at something that looked fake. And you never know where you're going to see special effects. Sometimes it's a green screen out a window. It just depends. Um, the best thing about the episode was, in terms of VFX, was how people sort of turned into pebbles and then disintegrated. And I assume that's partly VFX and partly makeup. But it was really the only thing that, you know, being that dulled at all, being ba repeatedly bashed up the head with this freaking SJW message. And as with everything else, it's fine work in the service of pure SJW virtue signaling. It was impossible to be given any moment, aside from those pebbles, really, to really shine because you're stuck with being whacked over the head with an SJW message until you get a freaking concussion. Costume design was by Ray Holman. He uh, 
You know, a costume, a costume, I say it all the time, it's always true, a costume should tell you something about your character. So, for example, people make choices about the, the kind of clothes that they wear all the time. If you saw me on the street, you'd probably see me in some kind of geeky t-shirt with jeans. That's what I would wear, and it tells you something about me. The geeky shirts say, hey, look, this is some kind of geek. <laughs> um, you know, when I'm on the show, I am making a conscious choice about what I'm wearing. I'm wearing this western vest, white shirt, the hat, the bolo tie, very specifically to make push my brand to push that I am a folksy kind of guy making uh, reviews and commentary from places that you don't ordinarily hear them from and by extension kind of showing that hey look my part of the country compared to what all of the people on the coasts may think is not stupid you know we're educated so a costume should tell you something about a character and that was all happening here but it was you know completely overshadowed by being constantly Bashed in the head with that two by four of SJW wokeness. The audience never really had a chance to appreciate any of the costume because they were too busy either cringing or throwing up in their mouths a little. Makeup supervisor was uh, Emma, and Emma Cowan. Um, again, the makeup was good. The best thing about this episode was that turning to dust with the pebbles and all that. Again, which I assume is partly makeup and partly visual effects. Uh, it was really the only thing that dulled, being bashed in the head repeatedly with a 2 by 4 with SJW nonsense. So at the end of any given review, we might ask ourselves, is it any good? No. Um, <laughs> it is the usual Chris Chibnall boring SJW cringe fest. You may safely ignore it. And spend uh, spend an hour watching anything from the David Tennant or Matt Smith Matt Smith's era. Frankly, I suggest them both. Watch the Day of the Doctor. Whenever, when in doubt about what Doctor Who to watch, watch the Day of the Doctor because it is the best Doctor Who episode ever made. So that's all that I really have to say about that. I would love to keep the conversation going, so please leave your comments, questions, and nasty remarks, and I'll do my best to respond to you. So a little bit of ad copy. <clears throat> Next time on the Fandime Masters Review of, St of Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 7, Can You Hear Me? The doctor answers cries for help from deep space, ancient Syria, and Sheffield. Now, Chris Chibnall must find a way to cave in your skull with a woke SJW message. That's next time on the Fandai Master's Review of Doctor Who Season 12, Episode 7, Can You Hear Me? And so, thanks for watching. That is all the time that we have today for Tales from SYL Ranch, where everyone is entitled to my opinion. And I'm Bill Stone. Ultimate power in this world has always been one simple thing, the control and manipulation of minds.